Shivaya, Om Namah 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 Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya Om Opponent No possibility of evil should be apprehended here, since there is the sanction of the scripture, and the scriptural views are not to be regulated by common norms. Vedantin to this, the answer is that this would be so in a case where the meaning can be ascertained. But when the meaning of the scripture is in doubt, it is nothing unbecoming to take the help of the canons of ordinary life for arriving at a decision. If, in accordance with this, the scripture is ascertained to mean the superimposition of the exalted status, it is but obvious that one will merely court evil by superimposing the idea of the lower on the higher. Now, because the words sun, aditya, etc., occur first, their primary meanings have to be accepted, for that creates no difficulty. And while the intellect remains occupied with these words in their primary senses, the word brahman makes its appearance in these sentences at a later stage. But since the word Brahman, in its primary sense, cannot stand in apposition with the sun, etc., the only remaining conclusion that stands affirmed is that the intention here is to prescribe the superimposition of the idea of Brahman. Besides, from the use of the word iti, meaning as, after Brahman, in aditam Brahma iti upasita, this very meaning becomes appropriate. Thus it is that the Upanishad everywhere uses the word Brahman with an iti after it, in such sentences as Brahma iti adeshaha, Brahma iti upasita, Brahma iti upaste, and so on, while the words aditya, sun, etc. are used by themselves. From this it follows that, as in the sentence Shuktikang Rajatamiti Pratyeti, he perceives the nakra as silver. The word Shuktika, nakre, denotes the nakre itself, while the word Rajata, silver, denotes an appearance of silver by a figure of speech meaning thereby that the man has merely a cognition of silver, though in fact there is no silver. So in the present case we understand that one has to look upon the sun, etc., as Brahman. Again, by using the accusative case, after Aditya, etc., in the complementary portion, the Upanishad shows that the sun, etc., are the objects of the verb to meditate, as in he who, having known thus, meditates about the sun as Brahman. Yasa evang vidvan adityang brahma itti upaste. Chandogya 3.19.4 He who meditates about the organ of speech as Brahman. Yovachang brahma itti upaste. Chandogya 7.2.2 he who meditates about resolve as Brahman. Ya sankalpam Brahma iti upaste. Chandogya 7, 4, 3. As for the assertion that the meditation on Brahman itself is to be preferred here for the sake of acquiring the result, that is untenable, since according to the above reasoning, the sun, etc., are themselves known as the objects of meditation but the result will of course be ordained by Brahman in these cases, just as much as in the cases of the service to the guests and so on, for Brahman is the ordainer of everything. This fact was elaborated under the aphorism, From him are the fruits of action, since that is reasonable. Brahma Sutra 3.2.38
the very fact that the idea of Brahman is superimposed on the symbols is a worship of Brahman just as much as the imagination of the images as Vishnu and others is the worship of those deities. Namaste. Well, this is a very deep discussion because the question here in this video and in the previous one is about who is superimposed on who? Huh? We released a video last night analyzing this question in depth. And the answer is that it depends on your point of view. You see, many things in the Vedas are there only to cater to people who are stuck in illusion. For example, the issue of the descriptions of the creation came up in a recent comment that well, why does it sometimes say that fire comes before air in the creation of the elements and in other descriptions air comes before fire, which is correct? Well, the answer is the descriptions of the creation in the Vedic scriptures vary. In fact, they're all different. No two of them are alike. Because this is to tell us that the creation is not really very important. The descriptions of the creation are only given as a kind of a courtesy to those who are trapped in duality and think that the creation is real. In other words, if the Vedas, from the very beginning, insisted that the creation is unreal, this would alienate the majority of people who are convinced that it is real. So, in other words, they give varying different answers to show that, eh, this is not really a serious topic. Uh, this is only there to pacify the ignorant. And that once you learn the truth, you don't care about it anyway. Huh? Who cares if fire comes before air? I mean, really, it doesn't matter. Huh? <laughs> That's a nice pun. It doesn't matter because there is no matter. Matter is simply an appearance. It's an illusion. So in the same way, this discussion about whether the sun is superimposed on Brahman or Brahman is superimposed on the sun is really about nothing because it's only an appearance, which at a certain point in the development of sadhana is necessary and important. But then when one gets beyond that stage, it's not important anymore. Huh? If the whole creation is illusory, then what does it matter? See? So, the Vedic scriptures are written by fully enlightened, realized beings, like Shiva and Shakti and Narayana. And they come down to us through the great sages in the early days of the universe and are propagated by Lord Brahma during the creation. So we really are not the persons designed to, to understand these scriptures, you know, from the higher point of view. They are actually aimed at the lower point of view of the unenlightened people who are in ignorance about the nature of the world. That's so that these scriptures will become popular and accepted by people in general. We don't want to diminish the credibility of the scriptures 
by starting right off the bat saying, as is all illusion. See, we're talking about non-duality now, Advaita. After 12 years on this channel and five or six more years before that on our previous channel, dealing with topics of duality and mixed duality and non-duality. So finally, we're getting around to the highest conception of unmixed non-duality, Kevala Dvaita, which is the philosophy of Shankaracharya. So don't think that what we're saying now obviates or uh, disproves or makes irrelevant what was said before. It doesn't. But this topic is only for the most intelligent people, the most realized people, and the others are more or less preliminary, leading up to it. Now, why did we go into those preliminary topics in such depth? Well, one reason was we wanted to understand the progression of human consciousness as it develops through sadhana. And the best way to understand it is to work through it ourselves. Even though, you know, theoretically, we had no need for those topics. But because our service is to explain them to people, we had to understand them experientially. So, there's precedent for this. For example, Paramahansa Ramakrishna, after his enlightenment, went back and explored God-realization from several different viewpoints, including the Christian and Islamic points of view and scriptures and so on, teachings and practices so that he could understand the minds of the people that he had to teach. You see, this is compassion. This is the reality, that unless you understand the mind of the audience, you cannot deliver a message that resonates with them. Now, we are in the stage of talking about Kevala Dvaita, and so we've noticed that a lot of the people who are our audience back in the days when we were talking about Sri Vidya and before that when we were talking about Buddha's teaching and so on, have left. And a whole new audience has come based on their attraction to this Advaita teaching. However, we have to point out again and again that without those prerequisites, you don't have the karmic foundation to realize non-duality. Without having paid the karmic debt to God for our creation and the creation of the world that we live in, we cannot get liberation. So, in other words, we have to perform karma yoga and bhakti yoga because those not only build up a reservoir of good karma that we can use to become fortunate and prosperous and free from all kinds of problems in our lives so that we can meditate without interruption, but it also clears our debt with Ishwar and Shakti for creating us and this universe that we live in. So these topics are not to be rejected by those who want to realize Kevala Dvaita. Rather, they have to be completed before one is actually qualified to realize the non-dual reality. You know, this might sound like bad news to some people because they want a shortcut. They want to skip all the hard work and just jump up and get the result. That's not possible.
That's why Shankaracharya says that an interpretation of the Vedic scriptures that is based on the desire for a result is flawed. It will always lead to a misinterpretation. Because in the beginning of spiritual life, we have no idea what that result is. We say, oh yeah, I want liberation. But, you know, what does that mean? It means we have to let go of all duality. And if we're still attached, if we still have desires, if we still see things in terms of self and object, you know, subject and object, duality and so on, we are not eligible for liberation. So the things that block us, the upadis that cover us, the misconceptions that blind us to the actual reality have to be overcome. Otherwise, we reach all kinds of nonsensical conclusions, <laughs> like some of the comments we've been getting lately about Brahman. And, well, that's for a separate video. But for this video, we have to know that whether Brahman is superimposed on the sun or the sun is superimposed on Brahman simply depends on your point of view. Om Tat Sat. Om Shakti Om. Om Namah Shivaya.